Okay, good morning, Boker Tov. want to uh, thank the uh, Bombs, Greta Bomb, for sponsoring uh, this month's Amuna Shiram in uh, memory of her grandmother, Rochabas, from uh, Devoros Neshama should have an Aliyah. We are still uh, going through Ravoba Zamun, Amunaso Yechia, and we are in the middle of the essay, Vad Beis, Amuna Tricha Shmira. The idea that Amuna is not a ideology or a philosophy. Amuna is not evidence or proven. Amuna is a mida, a character trait, and we live with it. Just like we try to acquire patience or generosity, we also try to acquire the character trait of Amuna, of living a life in which we see Hashem uh, everywhere involved, in which we lean on Him, turn to Him, and so on. Revoba then developed the notion that whatever is more delicate and whatever is more precious is also often more fragile, therefore requiring greater protection. The less value something has, so to say, cheaper it is, then the less protection it needs. And therefore, to live with Amunah, to live with faith in our lives, to know that everything is for a reason, is something which is not going to happen easily and doesn't come without effort or work. But it, tremend- it takes uh, tremendous uh, toil, it takes tremendous effort in order to uh, consistently emphasize that Amunah within, within ourselves. Okay, and lastly, we left off last week, I believe, which um, about technology, realizing that... Uh, he spoke about It's not an idea, it's not theory, but really everything is about, we see through technology that it's a metaphor for how to connect to Hashem. He doesn't spell it out. Revolba passed away before the uh, proliferation of, of technology of Wi-Fi. But the notion that we make a connection to something we can't see, and you can have connection at different speeds, and the ability to upload and to be able to download. It's all a metaphor for living with Hashem, the Amun of living with Hashem. Okay, so we're in the middle paragraph, that little one-line paragraph in the middle of page Chafei. Because Amun is so delicate, it's so easy for it to become shattered. It's so easy for it to break into, into pieces. It's so delicate, it needs protection. It needs mindfulness and conscientiousness. We have to always keep, cap- we have to keep catching ourselves. And in all circumstances, stop and say, it's okay, it's what Hashem wants. This is, this, is what's, this is the way it's meant to be right now. We have to remain very, very mindful and dedicated to it. Among our character traits of the soul, it's such a delicate uh, and fragile one that we have to know what will reinforce Emunah and what are, will be the obstacles, the impediments, what is going to try to threaten our emuna? We have to therefore embrace the things that will strengthen our emuna, the people, the ideas, the uh, messages, the type of things that will strengthen our emuna. And when we can identify the things that undermine our sense of emuna, then we have to uh, be aware of them so that we can avoid them, we can manage them, and so on. So what does that mean? So this is a transition into this next paragraph. <laughs> One of the character traits or qualities, which is the biggest um, contradiction to living a life of emunah, of faith, is gaiva, is arrogance, is ego. A person who has an inflated ego, an inflated sense of themselves, an inflated sense of self-worth or self-importance, an inflated sense of, of uh, their dea, that their opinion or the way they view the world or what they think should happen is more authoritative. They think that it's more correct, more right, more just, it should be listened to, everyone else around them has to defer to them. This character trait of gaiva, which says the world has to fall in step, hook, line, and sinker the way I want it to be. I want there to be no traffic, I want to take off on time, I want my children to behave, I want my spouse to do exactly what I've asked them to do. I want the people around me, I want nature, the natural order. Why is it raining? I wanted it to be sunny today. Why is it sunny? I needed rain in my backyard today. A person who thinks that the world needs to meet their expectations. The person who wakes up in the morning with a sense of entitlement, that everything's going to happen the way I want it to. Everyone around me is gonna be healthy. Everyone around me is gonna give me nachas. Everybody, everything in life is going to work. My technology, everything is gonna happen. That midah, that character trait of gaiva, that attitude of, of, of I, that ego, is what is, what is the biggest obstacle to living life of emunah. Because the Kodesh Baruch Hu, the Almighty looks at us and says essentially, look, there's not enough room in the world for both of us. If you want to be in charge, no problem. I'll step out. I'll step out. If you think it's all about you, what you think is supposed to be the way it's supposed to be, if you think it's all about you, that you deserve that you're entitled, if you think that you're in charge and you are in control, and you think I should defer to you, I'm not competing. 
The Rebun Hashem says, I'm not competing. I'm not going to try to shout louder than you, somebody very close to me in my life, while the normal uh, communication method is when one is talking and another wants to be heard, they just shout louder, then the other one shout louder, then the other one shout louder, and the decibel level then is just through the roof, as everybody, if you have a home full of particular gender, then everybody is just trying to make themselves heard in life, so they're out shouting the next to the decibel level, so there's someone in our life who just won't compete. So if everyone's shouting, they just, okay. It doesn't have to be said. So if you're humble, then you don't compete to try to outshout. So Hashem says, I'm not going to try to compete with you. If your daya, if you think that your view, if you think that your attitude, if you think the way it's supposed to be should supersede mine, I should defer to you, I'm not going to compete with you. I'm not going to outshout you. Hashem says, I'm out of here. Now, what's the consequence of Hashem saying he's out of there? When Hashem is involved in our life and we defer to Him and He's in charge, so, so He has a divine perspective and we have a very finite perspective. He knows what's the right thing for us overall and we're trying to grapple to figure out what's the right thing to do. He is the one who controls the natural order and the elements and we are figuring out how to survive them. If Hashem says, I'm out of here, then it means that we are now exposed. We're now vulnerable to it. So if there's a conflict or a contradiction between doing it our way or His way, His way is probably the better way to go. <laughs> He's the omnipotent, infinite creator of the universe, and we are finite, pathetic, future uh, nothingness. So Gaiva arrogance, the sense of ego, what, what's called in, in Musr, Anochius. Anochius is the sense of ego, the Anochi, the I. Is life filled with I? Is everything about I? Is everything about me? Anochi omed ben Hashem of Einechem, the Pasuk says. What does it mean, Anochi omed ben Hashem of Einechem? So Moshe was telling the people, I'm standing between you and God, but the Bali Musar tell us to read it, not I'm standing between you and God as an agent or as an intermediary, but more of the Anochi Omed, that a sense of Anochi, a sense of I is standing between you and God. You want to be close to God, you want to cling to God, you want to attach yourself to God, then you need to sublimate your sense of Anochi, the sense of I. Everything has to be my way, my way, the highway, the way I drew it up. That's the way to get close to God. Because if you have the sense of I that's out there, not only in a relationship with Hashem, it's in a relationship with everybody. If you're asserting your ego, it's very hard to form a relationship, a meaningful relationship with anybody. Hagaiva hikoch ikari ba'adam, hargashos hayeshus. Gaiva is a core um, value or character trait within a person. Hargashos hayeshus, that feeling of existence is the sense of I. We're living in a time where we're the opposite phenomenon. Too many people don't have any self-esteem, any self-worth, any sense of I. You really have to be like the three bears. You have to have just the right sense of I. <laughs> Too much I, you can't have any real relationships in your life. You're going to drive the people around you, and you're going to drive the Rebbe Shalom far away. Too little sense of I, I exist, I add value, I have meaning, I have worth, I'm here for a reason, I have a contribution to make. If you don't feel that, it's called mental illness. It's mental health crisis of people who have no sense of self-worth, no sense of being consequential, no sense of value. So, yeshus, that sense of existence that I'm here, that I make a difference. Rabba emunasecha, that Hashem, you believe in me. I woke up this morning, you believe in me. I have a contribution to make in this world. The world would be at a loss, would be deficient without me. That sense of, of yeshus, of existence, it's critical to our own, our own mental health. You have to, you have to be alive, we have to, we have to believe. But you can't assert it too much. Exactly, like the two feelings, that balance. This has been quoted in the name of many Rebbes. That a person has to go through life carrying a, a little petek, a little note in each pocket. In one pocket it says, Anochi offer ve'efer, I am dust, I am nothing, I'm gornished. And the other pocket says, Bishvili never olam, the whole world was created just for me. And when you're feeling low and insignificant and inconsequential and invisible, you remind yourself, Bishvili never olam, the whole world, God says, was worth creating just for you. And if you're feeling the whole world was created just for me, then you take out the other note that says, Anochi afar ve'efer, I am gurnished, I am nothing. Hamezga omer la'atzma, a person who's too proud, arrogant, says to themselves, Komasha svivi shayach li, everything around me belongs to me. It belongs to me. Vani ba'alim alav, and I'm in charge of everything. Everything is supposed to operate the way I want. I'm in charge, I'm in control. From the time a child can walk, they already begin to feel a sense of I. From the moment you build your first set of Lego, you think, I'm the builder, I make Lego. Who was my sibling to step on it, to crush it, to break it? They destroyed my world. That's not the way it was supposed to go. I wanted this Lego to last. So the first time that you could build Lego, which is at a very young age, you already feel, I build, I control. 
I organize. It's it's really it's what I want. Who chashu apol? As kol alam who roa derech hamishkafayim shelo, and he sees the entire world through his glasses. Ketzad akom is kasheri lavu l'tovaso. I mean, a baby start even before you could build Lego. The baby is baby is the most ego centric. <laughs> The most egocentric part of human life is by being a newborn baby. You cry, you need to be held. You need a diaper change, you're hungry, it's the middle of the night, you don't care about anyone around you. If, you're, if your 15-year-old knocked on your door at 3 a.m. and said, I'm really hungry, there's nothing to eat, <laughs> you'll have a very different reaction than if your three-week-old cries in the middle of the night, and through that cry is saying, I am hungry and I have nothing to eat. Because at three months old, that level of maturity, we expect the baby, who's not yet cognitively matured, to a 3 a.m. say through crying, I'm hungry, I want something to eat. The 15 year old is still knocking on your door at 3 a.m. saying, I'm hungry, I have nothing to eat. It's going to be a very different response and reaction. <laughs> very different. So what ends up happening is the more that we think we control the world, we manipulate things around us, we're in charge. My voice operated this. My car that drives on its own. My phone I can talk into and it tells me anything bad. I'm in charge. I tell the world what to do. Air conditioning, go on. Lights, turn off or turn on. Car, take me to this destination. So I'm barking orders to the whole world about what to do. And voice operated controls listen to my orders and respond and do what I've told them to do. So why shouldn't that happen to the people around me? I'll bark orders to my mother and father. I'll bark orders to my spouse. I'll bark orders to my children. I'll bark orders to my boss. And I expect them, like voice control, to just respond and do exactly what I've barked at them to do. How the Margish you balabaya salatsmo, but bechinas aniva fcod. Ain't shum davar ba olum chutz mimeni. So a person starts to think, I'm the balabas. I'm in charge of myself. I'm in charge of myself. If I eat unhealthy, I get fat. If I exercise and eat right, I'll lose weight. If I work hard, then this happens. If I don't, then that happens. So you start to, what's the conclusion that you draw? That there's a, a uh, action and reaction. There's a cause and effect. I'm the cause. I create the effect. Who's really in control? Who's really in charge? It's all me. As long as a person is immersed, immersed in that sense of self, as long as the person is immersed in the sense that they are the center of the universe and that everything revolves around them, there's no room for God. There's no room for Amuna. You're not going to see him. He's everywhere. He's right in front of you. He's talking to you, but you won't even see him. He'll feel invisible because you're so self-absorbed and so consumed by this notion that you are the center of the universe, that you are the center of the universe. I think there's a huge challenge in parenting today, this phenomenon of uh, helicopter parenting where we don't let children fall. There was a book that long preceded this, this generation's crisis called The Blessings of a Skin Knee. What was her name? Who wrote it? Wendy Mogul. Wendy, right. Mogul. Wendy Mogul. She wrote The Blessing of a Skin Knee. What was the idea? That when you fell and you skinned your knee, that was part of growing up. That's great. You fell off your bicycle, you hurt your knee. Baruch Hashem. That's amazing. Because if you coast through life and you never fall and scratch yourself, then all you're doing is setting yourself up for an enormous disaster down the road. It's important to fall, it's important to feel pain, it's important to have failure, it's important for things to not work out. And this generation, this helicopter parenting phenomenon is that we sweep in, we rescue, we make it better, we don't allow anything to fail. Too big to fail. Our children are too small to fail. We don't let anything fail. And failure is the biggest, biggest classroom. Failure is the number one way that we learn. And we also learn that it's not up to us. I, I, I didn't get in where I wanted to go, so, yeah, you have to have a moon. That's not where you were meant to be. That door closed. Another door is going to open, and it's going to bring you to where you were meant to be. That shirk didn't work out. That job didn't work out. That whatever didn't... That's where you were meant to be. You need to have joy. You need to have happiness. That's where you were meant to be. Hatsar harishon b'derech la'amunah hu akar sheish koach me'alav. So the first step in a life of amuna is to realize, I'm not in control. I'm not in charge. This world is much bigger than me. I have my opinions, and I take my initiative, and I proactively make my effort, and I try to make the difference. I say the right things, I do the right things, I try to fashion a trajectory that is what I think is right. And once I've done everything I can, I stop and I let go and I let God. And I realize I've done everything I can. So either I can be robbed of my happiness, my joy, my serenity, I can live a life of anger, impatience and envy, or I could say, you know what, I've done everything I can, and the rest, this is the way it's meant to be. This is up to Hashem. So the moment that a person's willing to concede, 
A moment a person is willing to forfeit and to say, I'm not in charge, I'm not in control, I'm not everything. This room, I'm making space, I'm making room for other people to have opinions, and I'm making room for the Rebona Shalom, for the Almighty, with whom I'm trying to develop a close relationship, who has the final say, and who has the most authoritative opinion, and who wears the pants in every family. I'm making room, I'm stepping back and making room for the Rebona Shalom's opinion. Kozman, my opinion fills the whole room, there's no space for anyone else. I suck all the air out of the room. Kodesh Baruch says, I'm out. The first step to living a life of Amuna is to have the humility and the modesty to say, I'm making space for Hashem. I'm making space for Him. I'm making space for Him. You can't have it both ways. Arrogant people can't have Amuna. Arrogant people can't have relationships. I see it all the time in marriages where one is, is dictating to the other, one is micromanaging, controlling the other, one is dominating the other, one is not in the way that the other's happiness and relieved that they don't have to take care of things because the other's taking care of it. I mean they're dominating, they're robbing the other person of the right to have an opinion. They're robbing them of the right to have a feeling. They're robbing them of the right to have uh, influence, to be influenced. So you can't have any, rela- arrogant people can't have real relationships. They think that they do and they're fooled. They don't realize that everyone around them it, it's, it's a counterfeit relationship. It's inauthentic. It's not real. If you're arrogant, there's no space for other people. Part of the arrogance is to, is to actually make yourself believe that everybody loves you <laughs> when everybody's just humoring you or everybody's just getting bare with the bare minimum of a relationship with you. So the first step towards any meaningful relationship, marriage, parenting, friends, at work, and the ultimate relationship with our Creator, with Hashem Izbarach, is to work on our sense of modesty and humility, to realize I'm finite. I'm imperfect, I make mistakes, I fail, I'm just one opinion, and there are so many others. B'tfila, we're on the next page. B'tfila, in our davening, yeshna is yachasus la'akara shel ha'talos b'borei olam. In our davening, we relate to this notion of our attaching ourselves and relying and connecting with Hashem. B'birchas yotzer or ana omrim, in the bracha we say every morning, yotzer or avorei choshech ha'as ha'shalom avorei sakol, Hashem, you created light, you created darkness, you make shalom, uborei sakol. Now the truth is, this is a, comes from a pasuk in Yeshayahu. This comes from a pasuk in Perak Memhe of Yeshayahu, and we quote it in our davening inaccurately. The end of this pasuk is, yotzer or avorei choshech, Hashem, you make light, you also make dark. You make peace, uvorei yes, anyone know how the pasuk really ends? Uvorei yes, hara. You create what is, what is evil, what is negative. We can't deal with that. We can't deal with that. To every morning start our day davening, saying, God, you're also responsible for that which is so painful and bitter, with that which is so hard, it's hard for us. So we say, Borei Sakol. We just euphemistically, we, we like gloss over it. You create everything, everything. We can't focus on. We actually inaccurately, we, we sort of censor ourselves. We can't, we can't bear saying that Pasuk accurately every morning. So we conclude it, Uvorei Sakol. So in this section, in this bracha, we say, Adon Uzenu Tzur Mizgavenu Magenu Yushenu Mizgav Ba'adenu. Four descriptions. How do we describe God? Adon Uzenu. We ask Him to have mercy on us. He's Adon Uzenu, master of our strength. Tzur Mizgavenu, our sheltering rock. Tzur is a rock, Mizgavenu, we find shelter in Him. Magen Yushenu, He's the shield that saves us. Mizgav Ba'adenu. He is our protective fortress. A Mizgav is a fortress. Ba'adenu on our behalf. So we have these four expressions. Adon uzenu, tzur misgavenu, magen yishenu, misgav ba'adenu. They seem redundant. They seem like they overlap a lot. What's the difference between our uh, master of strength, he's the rock that we find shelter in, he's the shield that saves us, he's the fortress that protects us. Are they just four synonyms to describe the same phenomenon? What's the difference? Says Ravob according from the Grom, Mavar Rabbeinu Avram ben Agra, the Gra's son, these four descriptions correspond with four different periods of our life. A person needs Hashem's help in all the days of our life. But depending on what stage of life, we see our reliance and dependence on Hashem in a different way. When you're a young child, you feel that Hashem is just a master. He's the Adon Uzenu. He's the master of our strength. A master is like somebody who bosses you around. You're a kid. I really want to eat this and go there and do this. I have to submit. What can I do? I have to concede to Adon. He's a master. So a child, an unsophisticated, immature child, just sees God as this master dominating him. But Tkufas Abagros in adolescence, Miyachis Latzmenu Yoser Koach. We feel that we're even stronger. As a Kashborcho Roa Rak We see Hashem as a rock. 
Betkuva Shlish Magich Kodesh Baruch Meseyelo. In the third, we think that he's just helping us. He's Magain Yishenu. He's a shield. He's helping us. Ve'ilu Betkuva Zkena Zikna. When we get older, Kasher Magish Af Yisusa. When we feel like we're nothing without him, then Mekasher Es Komash Yishlo Kodesh Baruch Hu Hu Makir Bekach Shu Levado Mekor Kol Kochosov Mizgav Ba'adenu. Misgav means he's a fortress on our behalf. A fortress means I'm vulnerable without him. I need to go. I need to go live within him. I find refuge. I find protection from him. So, in other words, in different de- de- stages of life, at different levels of maturity, we either don't want to feel we rely on Hashem. We feel we rely only on ourselves. To the vulnerable, fragile person in an older age who doesn't any longer feel that they can run a marathon or lift a car, they realize that in the end of the day, their life is so fragile, unpredictable, that it's entirely up to Hashem. These four different stages. So what's this point? A young person feels that they don't have to work on arrogance. Because that type of effort, that type of work, will bother him. That person is trying to develop. They're trying to find themselves. So humility... And finding yourselves, they think, don't go together. How am I supposed to know who I am? What are my strengths? What are my talents? What are my blessings? I'm trying to carve my space in the world, make a space for me. Who am I? So if, if humility is trying to focus less on yourself, dafka during the period of life where you're exploring and trying to find yourself, so a young person thinks they don't need to. So what do you do? So the answer is to work on humility through davening. So Ravoba says here, davening is essentially an exercise in, in humility. That's what davening is all about. Every time we stand up and we daven to Hashem, what we're doing is it's an exercise in humility. Hashem, I'm about to give a big speech. Help me find the right words. Help me deliver it well. Help it land. Help it, help it fulfill the, your, your purpose and your mission for me. Hashem, I'm about to travel. Help it go smoothly. Hashem, just go through the whole Amidah, the middle section of the 13 brachos that are requests for knowledge and good health and forgiveness, for justice, for, for parnasa, for livelihood. All of these things, what you're saying to Hashem is, I'm going to take initiative, I'm going to do the best I can, but in the end of the day, I submit to you that you're in charge, you're in control. So davening is an exercise in humility. You're working on the sense of, of humility, that I'm not in control, that I'm not in charge, that really it's all up to you, whatever I want, whatever I need, that it's really entirely up to you. We have a Pasuk in this week's Parsha. We've spoken about it many times. Ein od mil vado. Ein od mil vado. We, we have a beautiful artwork hanging in our home after the last time we focused on this. Ein od mil vado. There's nothing but you, Hashem. Ein od mil vado. Yes, there are doctors and scientists, and there are brilliant uh, technology people. And yes, we've sent man to the moon, and yes, but in the end of the day, that's all an illusion, that we're in charge, that we're in control. Ain od mil vado. It's up to you. It's up to you. Ain od mil vado. And Rav Chaim Velazhin, or Nefesh Chaim, has this tradition that a person who, in a moment of challenge, of crisis, is able to find within themselves not only the ability to say the words, but to feel them, then ain od mil vado, that there's nothing but you, Hashem, Ain od mil vado, that such a person will be spared, will be saved, that person will be blessed. Now, that's hard to reconcile with the reality because we know many, many incredibly righteous people who uttered those words, ain od mil vado, and they didn't have a miraculous cure, and they didn't have a miraculous comeback. And so how do we reconcile that promise of Rav Chaim Velazhin, or the tradition, that if you say the words sincerely, ain od mil vado, there is nothing but you, how do we reconcile that? So we have to understand that the notion of of that promise is not necessarily in this world. It's all about having the ability. Amuna doesn't make things go away. Amuna doesn't make the cancer go away or make the fertility happen or make you find that shidduch or make the job come through. Amuna doesn't make the people around you behave the way you want them to behave. What Amuna does is it's the ultimate Xanax. It's Xanax. It's Xanax. Yeah, it's Xanax. You know, I've been with a lot of people. For a living, I am with people in moments of, of terrible crisis. And in those moments of terrible crisis, the pain is so unbearable, it's so overwhelming in that moment of crisis. Baruch Hashem, chemically we've developed um, options and medicines that a person is able to take and it's able to carry them. They're able to endure. They're able to endure through it. So, ain't od mil vado. 
Inor Milvado is Xanax. Is it's a form of Xanax. That a person is feeling overwhelmed in crisis, and, and let me be very clear that I'm not suggesting it as an alternative to Xanax. If a person has been prescribed Xanax and if a person needs Xanax, okay. I'm not suggesting that you leave it in the medicine cabinet and just say Ein Od Milvado. In cases where it's properly prescribed and properly used, follow whatever, um, whatever uh, a doctor's uh, orders are. But what I'm saying is that Ein Od Milvado works the same way. If you take a Xanax pill, so does it make the problem that you're trying to endure go away? No. It gives you the capacity to stay calm and to stay serene and to be present and to be able to survive whatever it is that you're trying to overcome. So there are people who've had to take Xanax to attend a funeral of a loved one. There are people who've had to take Xanax to get through a job interview. There are people who have to take Xanax to walk a child down an aisle. There are people who have to take Xanax in all kinds of circumstances. And Ein and Od Milvado works in the same mechanism. Instead of the difference is this. Xanax is chemically altering your state and it's essentially masking the sense of anxiety, the anxiousness, the crisis that you feel inside, it's masking. And when you come off, when the Xanax wears off, those feelings are just going to come back. Ein od melvado is not just taking care of the symptom, it's going right to the cause. And Ein od melvado says that if a person can submit, if a person can concede, if a person can recognize that everything is from Hashem, and whatever is happening is meant to be. And we don't understand it, but we are finite. And yet, it makes sense somehow, somewhere, and someday we'll see. And a person is able to really, really absorb and ingrain and live that way, then they haven't just masked the symptom of the pain they're in. They're able to actually relieve the pain. They're able to actually relieve the pain. The pain may come back then too. And you got to say, Enod Malvado again. And saying the words is not enough. You've got to feel it. But that's Rav Chaim Velazhner's promise of Ein Od Milvado. There is nothing but him. And the famous story we've shared before, the Briskarov was running from the Nazis in the story and he thought he was going to be caught. And he started to feel that, you know why I'm vulnerable, they're going to catch me? Because I forgot. I thought there's something Milvado, there's someone else but him. I thought there's such a thing as Nazis. And the moment I realized Ein Od Milvado, that everything is from Hashem, he's orchestrating the universe, the Briskarov described, he returned to that feeling of Ein Od Milvado, a calm came over him, and he, in his circumstance, was able to endure, was able to survive that horrific crisis. But even when we can't, that Ein Od Milvado is what gets us through. It's what gets us through. That's, that's, that's our Xanax. That's what gets us through. We also have in our hayom that we say in our davening, when we read the Torah, this is what we say before we read the Torah. What do these words mean? This is the mitzvah of dveikas. This is the notion that we cling to Hashem. We cling to Hashem. We don't just have faith with Hashem in the abstract, but we live with this knowledge of Hashem's involvement in our life, and we cling to Him. That word dveikas, to cling to Hashem, comes from the word devek. Devek means glue. It means glue. We attach ourselves to Hashem. We know that he has our back. We attach ourselves to him. And we're able to achieve a sense of hayom on this day. Every day is lived to its fullest. We make it through the day when atem hadvekim, when we're able to attach ourselves. We're able to attach ourselves. So, you know, we're in the midst of uh, now the shiva for the loss of our, our dear, dear friend and amazing role model, Rebarach Tzvi Ben Ruvein Nassan. Rabbi Dr. Brian Galbert, and I can tell you as a, as a direct testimony, you know, we read books about righteous people who have unwavering amuna. I've read many articles about such people, and there's always that little PC that says, come on, you know, it's exaggerating. It's, you know, after the fact, trying to honor a person, so it's got to be like an exaggeration, right? It, it can't be real. It can't be real. So I want to tell you, having seen for the last two years and the last two months, up close, very up close, that there are people, there are extraordinary people. Brian sense of Ein Od Milvado, diagnosed with a death sentence, a glioblastoma, a brain tumor. But nevertheless, that, that Simcha, Ein Od Milvado, if you could dance to Ein Od Milvado, and you know that there's a Simcha Sachayim, that this, atemad, as long as Hatemad Vekim Hashem Lokechem, if you attach yourself to Hashem, that Hashem is amazing, that wow, Baruch Hashem, and Chasta Hashem, and Hashem is amazing, then, then, you can get through, th through, through anything. You can get through your neshama leaving this world at 47 years old and leaving a beautiful family behind. It is the strength that gets you through that and it is the legacy that gives you strength to the children and to the family and to the people that are left behind to simply follow and emulate and walk in that exact way that ain't owed malvado.
that ain't od mavado, to literally sing and dance to ain't od mavado, to ain't od mavado. It's, a, it's an astounding level. And I'm not saying it's easily accessible or achievable for all of us, but we need to know that there are people who did it. And I can tell you that, that Brian Zamuna didn't, didn't come when he was diagnosed. It's not that he sat down then and started working on Amuna. Yeah. His son-in-law made this point at the funeral in Israel. He spent a lifetime working on his Amuna so that when the time came that he would need to dig deep, he didn't wait to be prescribed Enod Milvado and then go have to pick it up at the pharmacy when he first got sick. He had been working on Enod Milvado that he had a storehouse of, of, of Enod Milvado pills accessible so that when it was necessary, he could draw from it. It's such a lesson for us for life, is that too many people wait for the crisis, and now that, where is God, and how God, and I need to try to feel God, and how can I find Amuna in a God, I don't know how, to, I, I want a Davin, I don't even know how to Davin. When we wait, when we wait, it's very, very hard to generate those feelings, and that relationship, and those truths, and to work on that quality in ourselves then. It's very hard. It's very hard to find it then. It's a lifelong process to be able to do it, and to be prepared for it. And I have to tell you, again, the healthy Brian, who, who I've known for many, many years, since we we're, were young, that was his attitude in all of life. When something didn't go his way, or it wasn't the way he wanted it to be, Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem. Since, in the few days, since his patira, since his passing, even I could tell you the journey of traveling to Israel and his funeral, which wasn't simple. It was a big complication that happened. Every time any one of us in that traveling party, which was a large party, um, got flustered or bent out of shape over something, we would remind each other, what would Brian do? And the whole thing changed to, Baruch Hashem, it's the way it's meant to be, isn't it better? It's like a whole, it, it's a whole, it's a whole, there was a mistake with the grave and it took two and a half hours to dig a new grave while we were waiting in the cemetery and it's in itself a whole disaster. But you know what? We, we realized, what would Brian say? He'd say, Baruch Hashem, you know, a few more minutes of being with him before we have to say goodbye. We ended up having a kumzitz and we sang his favorite songs while they were digging and while we were waiting. And, and if you bring that attitude of, of Ein Od Melvado and Atam Advekem Hashem Lokechem, if we're able to, to reprogram ourselves and make the default and the instinct and the intuition to be that way, then you have the power and the courage to get through anything because there's nothing more horrific. Whatever you're worried about in life, there's nothing more permanent or more conclusive or horrific or tragic than, than, than this, than leaving this world at a young age. So that doesn't mean to minimize the challenges that you, that we, that people around are going through. There are big challenges. This is what I spoke about before Eicha. And, and I was nervous that I don't want to sound like I'm minimizing. There are big challenges when your contractor doesn't finish on time and the paint color ran out and it wasn't what you expected it to be. Those are enormous challenges. I'm, I'm only being a little sarcastic. There are real challenges. There are real challenges, and it's, it's okay. It's okay to be annoyed and flustered, right? Like when the flight's delayed or the person was rude or the person cut in line ahead of you. or the per It's okay to be flustered and annoyed by things in life. It's okay. That's natural. It's normal. It's okay. Just within scope, within context, within reason. Say, so, yeah, that was really annoying. Thank God in the bigger scheme of things, it's nothing. I'm so grateful that that's my... It's a problem. It's an annoying problem. I got to fix it. It's a I got to deal with it. Thank God that's my problem. I'm so grateful that's my problem. And we don't know what the next chapter brings for other challenges that we have in life with people around us, with our children that we have big concerns about, with relationships that we have. We don't know. We don't know. But I'll tell you this. And I'll tell you this again, not because I'm speculating and not because I read it in a book about somebody. But I'm, t I'm telling you because I saw it directly, and anyone who knew him did, that he could turn any situation around. He got frustrated and flustered. There were things that were annoying. She said, Baruch Hashem, it's amazing. And then find the reason why it's amazing. You know what? It's homework. That's the avoda. You people never do your homework. You probably starve and haven't started your Hashkacha Pratis journal yet. <laughs> but but uh, I'll give you the next piece of homework for you not to do, which, uh, which is that you know, that, that whole, what would Brian do, is to say in every situation you're flustered, how can you spin that? That Baruch Hashem. There's something, there is a Baruch Hashem. No matter how challenging it is. It's hard, it's hard. But to find the Baruch Hashem of it, at least this. Or Baruch Hashem that. Or this gives me this opportunity. Or that is that. There's a, there's a Baruch Hashem. There are people. There are people. 
to cling to Hashem, to attach ourselves to Him, to declare Enod Milvado, not superficially and not in a fake way, in the most genuine, deep, profound, truest way to be able to sing Enod Milvado, Enod Milvado, that there is no one but Him, that there is nobody but Him, and to, and to concede that He's in charge, that He's in charge. And when we do, it doesn't reverse things, it doesn't bring a cure, but it enables you to have the strength to get through it. Where would you be without it? Collapse? Where, where would you be without it? You'd rather just, just be angry and stressed, ruin the rest of the relationships in your life. Where would you be without it? So the moment you could take that deep, deep breath and let go and let God, as they say in the program, let go and let God. I've done everything I can. I've tried to convince that person or I've tried to act this way. I've tried to take this initiative. I've tried to take that action. I've done everything I can. And now I have to let go, let God, and just not, not stress about it. Just not stress about it. You know, as a, a silly example, I told you the passport story last time or two times ago with uh, my daughter's passport, it didn't come, and it was the day we were leaving, and who knew? And, and our avoda, because uh, we come to this class, we, we also are attendees in the class, was, <laughs> as was happening, we said, look, we've done everything we could, we're trying to make it happen, it'll be as it'll be. What are we gonna, each day and each passing moment it doesn't arrive in the mail, like, does the stress make it come quicker? Does the, all it does is ruin your physical health, your mental health, and so on. So what's the alternative to Enod Melvado? If you want to be alive that day, if you want to have life, you know what the life source is for life, where we draw from to find life, to find the strength to live life, is through Atem Hadvekim, to cling to God and to say, I don't know how this is going to end up. I don't know how this is meant to be. I've done everything I can. And now, God, you're in charge. I'm going to show up. I'm going to attend. I'm going to do what I need to do. I'm going to participate the way I've been asked to participate. I've done everything I can, and I'm willing to let go, and I'm willing to let you, you be in charge. Ainod Mevada. Only you know how this ends. Only you know the big picture. Only you know the why. This is the way it was meant to be. This is the way it was supposed to be. This is the way it was supposed to be. When you live a life of that, then, then your son can get up at your funeral, as Brian's son did, and say, we don't know why this happened, and it's unfair, but this is the way Hashem wants it, and it's for the best. So his life didn't just give him the strength to get through it, he planted seeds within his children. He already left them the strength, he left them the, the capacity to be able to get through and to, to live life, which won't be easy for them, because that's how we live our lives. So w what choice do we have? That's it. So our arrogance, our ego, our sense that I know best, I know the way it's meant to be, I know how it's supposed to go, I need everyone to fall in line the way I want, that's the biggest obstacle to having a moon, that's the biggest obstacle to having happiness, to having relationships, to having peace and serenity. And if we want to be able to have those things, then we need to find the ability to live life with a modesty and a humility and to put aside our, our anochi, our sense of ego, and to make room for our Kodesh Baruch Hu to run the world in, as he only knows the best way to be.